Hello, global gardeners. It's Monday. Let's talk some gardening. I want to give a quick shout out to James Richter. Looking forward to my favorite part of Monday. Thank you, James, for that super chat donation. This is my favorite part of Monday, too. It's great to have you all here today. And thanks for being here, James, and everybody else from around the world on what could be a very hot day. Very, very many of us in the Western United States and many of us in Europe are experiencing record-setting heats. And some of us are tired of the heat already. We'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure, as we progress because it does play into the topic and the focus of today, which is plant diseases in the garden. So we'll be giving some framework on how you might approach some disease issues that have yet to come to your garden. And ideally, you can keep the diseases away. So we'll be talking diseases and heat and plant health and soil health and all of these factors that actually play together when you're trying to have a successful garden. So nice to see everybody. And let's go ahead and get started. When we talk about diseases in the garden, they fall into three basic categories. You have bacterial diseases, you have fungal diseases, and you actually have viral diseases. Now, as you well know, viruses in humans have gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of years. Well, there are viruses that can cause diseases in plants as well. We tend to think of disease as some fungus or some bacteria, but as you find through the progression today, the most insidious diseases might be those viral ones. And if you keep up your health, you are more likely to fight off those diseases that you might have exposure to. It's the same in the garden. If you can keep your garden healthy. If you can keep your soil and plants healthy, your plants are more likely to be able to fight off any of the diseases that they may encounter as well. Let's see, as we look at the comments, I see that Gardens Happen says, haven't had much issue with disease in my garden, thankfully. I've had powdery white mildew, thought I had leaf curl disease, but it turned out to be overwatering. A couple great points there, as I mentioned in the video that that uh, I did over the weekend. Leaf curl can definitely be caused and is most often caused by the overwatering or underwatering issues. So good for you to recognize that. You may have noticed, those of you who have watched a lot of my videos, you may have noticed that I don't have any videos on diseases in the garden. That's one reason why I wanted to talk about it today. Because as I make my videos, I like to show what's happening in my garden. I like to show what I'm doing, what I'm planning, all of my own garden activities. And like gardens happen, I don't have many, if any, disease issues in most of my garden beds. The only disease that I've mentioned in my videos is also the powdery mildew because that's the one that I've had. A big reason for that, and this is going to be the underlying theme, and I already mentioned it, keep your plants healthy. If you have a good soil and if you have healthy plants, they are less likely to get diseased. And that's been my approach for a number of years, is to try to keep my plants as healthy as possible and that will cut down on the likelihood of any diseases finding their way into my garden. So I haven't made videos about diseases, not because I'm embarrassed to show that I've done something wrong, but because I just don't have the diseases to show you. If diseases find their way into my garden, I will definitely do videos about it. And I'll definitely tell you how I'm planning to deal with those particular diseases. But until then, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And you can see that in the progression of my garden. It's the healthy soil, it's the life in the soil, it's proper watering, and bringing it back to the hot days, it's sheltering the plants whenever you can. When you encounter those weather difficulties, if you can shelter your plants to keep them from being overstressed or keep them from being damaged, 
then the likelihood of disease drops dramatically as well. So lots of lots of things to be thinking about. Nice to see your stream, Scott. Thank you for that. Here in South Korea, we are in rain season, and that makes all plants exhausted. Is there any tips for keeping my plant healthy in rainy season? Great tip or great question. And my tip is to try to keep the soil from becoming oversaturated. And so overwatering and underwatering is an issue. You've heard me say that before. In a rainy climate, that's hard to do. And so I like to garden in raised beds for many reasons that I've expressed in videos and on live streams. That's one of the ways to deal with a very rainy climate is to grow in raised beds and you have a nice, loose, well-draining soil so that when it does rain, the raised beds are more likely to drain faster than open ground. And if you, in your raised beds, have hoops that you can put a cover over, put a cover of a tarp or plastic or, or some, some uh, canvas cover that will actually shed off the rain. So if you have a raised bed that drains better than the surrounding ground and you cover that raised bed with something that the rain sheds off then you're going to have a drier bed and you're going to have less likelihood that the soil is going to be oversaturated so i i find that that's one of the best ways in very wet regions to be able to have almost a normal garden for some of us in very dry regions, it's the exact opposite. The soil is, is so dry, the air is, is so dry that we have to do everything we can to keep our soil moist. Even though raised beds dry out faster through the drainage and the exposure on their sides to the air, I find it's easier to have a better soil, a water retaining soil, and then the mulch in my raised beds than in my open ground beds. So I'm a huge advocate of raised beds, but particularly when it comes to weather, that's one of the reasons I like them is because you can control to some degree that little microclimate in that bed by having a raised bed with hoops and then burying the cover. Right now I'm using shade cloth on most of my beds on top of the hoops because that shade helps keep the soil from evaporate the soil moisture from evaporating quickly. So hope that helps you. And that's one of those kind of things that you can uh, move forward with. It, it takes extra effort if you're not doing raised beds right now, but I think in the long run that actually can make a big difference. Dixie Doodles, hello to you, hot and dry in Texas. That's not unusual. When the rain comes, it is violent and windy. Yes, it is. I've lived in, in Del Rio, and I've also spent time in San Antonio, and I've encountered those, those windy conditions and those hot, dry conditions, and it is unlike a number of other areas. And so, same idea. Shade cloth, I saw some earlier comments about the heat, and shade cloth can be a great way to protect your plants and and keep them from being stressed. Because, shifting back to the idea of the day, a stressed plant is more likely to be attacked by insects. And so this is how we have to start thinking about how do these diseases find their way into our plants. And insects are the most common way that those diseases find their way into our plants. The plants get weakened, the insects come. Insects are most likely to attack the weakened plants. They will further weaken the plant. And in many cases, as they start eating the leaves or boring into the stems, that's where the disease enters the plant. And so some little insects that you might not normally think much about like leaf hoppers and flea beetles and spittle bugs. They don't by themselves cause a lot of damage normally. They can, but if you just have a few of those kind of insects, most of us don't worry too much about it. But the damage that those insects make and the fact that 
quite a few insects can actually carry diseases. They can be a host. So they'll start chowing down on your plant and in the process, they'll introduce the disease to the plant. So to avoid that whole process, you wanna keep the insects from attacking your plants. And to keep them from attacking your plants, you wanna have big, strong, healthy plants that are more likely and more able to fight off the insects so that they never get a hold. Or in another section of your garden, and, and I do this uh, pretty much every year, if, if an insect attacks and I see a problem developing, one of the reasons I grow the same plant in different areas of my garden, if one of those beds has weakened plants, I let those be the magnet plant. I let those be the sacrificial plants. And those are the ones that the insects are most likely to attack, which means I can most easily deal with the insects in those plants. And the others are left alone because the others are nice and strong and not as weak. And that's a general philosophy of gardening is, is keep the plants strong. But when you have weak plants that are likely to be the victims of pests and diseases, you can use them to your advantage. And then at some point when those, if and when those plants become diseased, they're localized. You know exactly where it's coming because you prepared for it. You recognized that the weak plants are most susceptible to diseases. And then you get rid of those plants. That is a great way to keep disease from spreading in your garden. As soon as you see the plant diseased, get rid of it. Now, some diseases, it does depend on the disease. Some diseases might start in one branch and you can cut off that branch and stop the, the disease. But too often, we as gardeners wanna keep our plants alive. And so the plant gets diseased and we cut off the branches and then other branches get diseased and we cut off those branches and we do everything we can to keep that plant alive. Well, often it's better to just sacrifice the plant. Pull it up, bag it up and toss it out because as that disease progresses, it's going to spread. Not only to the rest of the plant, but possibly to the soil or to some of those insects. And that's what happens is you have a, a nice healthy leaf hopper and it jumps on top of an infected plant and starts eating away and then hops to another plant and spreads the disease in the process. So sometimes by trying to save our our ailing plants were inadvertently causing that disease to spread. So learn to recognize the disease in the first place and then move forward and, and sacrifice. Be willing to kill some plants to save the garden as a whole. So, okay, let's go ahead and get back to some of the other things. There's River and Dale. I have a stunted beat up cabbage and the beets are and the bugs are only eating that one. Eight more healthy ones right next to it. Thank you for sharing that because that's exactly right. And we've all seen that. The more we garden, the more we see that. The healthy plants right next to the ones are being eaten and they don't have any of the bugs on them at all because it's those weak ones that are being attacked and the diseases work the same way. So thank you. I appreciate that. Paul's Victory Gardens wondering, what can be done to the soil if the soil is impacted by a disease plant? Good question. And so... One of the things that that is prevalent in farming methods and what we have been taught for years in gardening is to rotate your crops. And most often the reason for rotating crops is because of the nutrients within the soil. The assumption being that we have to fertilize the soil and that plants are soaking up one type of nutrient. And so in the following year we plant a different type of crop that's going to use different nutrients. And by rotating our plants, we can keep our garden going and not have to worry about it. We just keep adding fertilizer. That's true. If the, and that can be a method that, that you follow. I like to just keep my soil healthy. And if I choose to rotate the plants, if I choose to grow a 
a type of crop in a different bed each year. That's because I'm just trying to find the best location for that plant. My tomatoes and cucumbers pretty much grow in the same beds every year. They're disease free, the soil is good, and I, I can keep growing them in those beds. Now, if one of those beds that I'm growing tomatoes or cucumbers or any other type of plant becomes diseased and it's the type of disease that can reside in the soil, then I'll start rotating. And that's that's a big way to do it. And it depends on the disease and, and you can do more research once you identify the disease you might have on the type of plant you have. But you remove the plant to minimize the introduction of that disease into the soil. And then the next year, you don't plant that same type of plant. Most of these diseases we're talking about, just like most insects, will target very specific plants. So there are diseases that affect tomatoes that won't affect corn. And there are diseases that affect squash that won't impact strawberries. And so learning the diseases you have and the type of plants that will carry that disease forward, you rotate your crops and you avoid planting those type of plants in a bed that you know to be diseased. And over a period of time, often it's at least three years, sometimes it might be as much as seven years, over time, that disease in the soil will dissipate and no longer be a problem and then you can start putting those plants back into that bed. And so it helps to have a bigger garden. If you've got a small garden and it becomes diseased, you are really going to struggle because that disease might become prevalent in most, if not all of your beds. It may mean that you stop growing that type of plant. That's kind of the worst case scenario that if you have a, a tomato disease that's soil borne and it ends up being in all of your beds and even rotating your crops and growing the tomatoes in different beds doesn't work. You may have to stop growing tomatoes completely in those beds and then move to something else like five gallon buckets or grow bags with new soil that you know isn't contaminated by disease and then you grow the plants in that location. There are some soil treatments for some diseases that's, that's nothing I've ever done and, and I don't worry too much about it, but it's recognizing the disease. Many diseases aren't soil borne. And so if you have disease that shows up in a bed, you might be able to just get rid of that plant and you'll still be able to continue with those same type of crops in that area in the future. So lots of variation in the type of plants. But as Paul was wondering, if the soil is impacted, you, you could swap out the soil. Or, more likely, and this is what's most common, you just don't grow, grow the same plant in that area for a number of years. Offline, nice to see you here on Monday. Every year there are brown spots on my sugar baby watermelon leaves, which is usually followed by very little flower formation. And so, when you do a little more research, and, and I suggest, hopefully this will be a starting point for all of you to do more research on diseases. And as you see things happen in your garden, try to identify if it's caused by an insect or if it's caused by a disease. The circles are an indication. And so you'll see this with uh, the patterns. And so if you do a search of, of brown spots on melon leaves, it'll lead you to sites that will have a thousand pictures of different types of spots on melon leaves. Some spots are caused by insects and how they feed on the leaf. Some spots are caused by bacteria. And when the bacteria gets into the leaf, it makes a nice little circle. That's a possibility. Some spots are caused by viruses. So it, it, it depends, you know, there, there needs to be more information. And so I suggest you do a simple search to see if you can find what the brown spots look like and see if you can find a site that identifies it as a disease or maybe just some type of insect that's feeding on the leaf and then it dies and it creates a little circle. Those are the kind of things to, to look into. The, the mosaic virus that is common in a lot of our plants it's caused that because as it hits the leaves, 
the pattern that it causes on the leads is, is like a mosaic, like an art design. And that's one way that you can identify that you have the mosaic virus on your plants. The same with um, uh, bacterial wilt spots that are in some plants, same type of thing. By identifying whether it's a small spot, a big spot, whether it's got rings on it, those are all very good indicators for you to be able to identify the type of disease that you have. And so uh, pay attention to your plants as these spots develop. I've got spots all the time that are caused by insects, holes that are caused by insects. Most diseases don't, don't create holes. So if there's a hole in your plant, it's most likely caused by an insect. If it's, if it's a ring, if it's a, a big spot, even little spots, a lot of little spots uh, can be caused by bacterial diseases. Those are the kind of things to start looking for. And then you get online, you find the picture, you identify it, and then you can find out the specific type of treatment to move forward. You might be able to treat the plant and get rid of the disease, or you might need to pull up the plant before it spreads and then toss it. And, and so at, when we treat our plants for disease, there are some common ways that are being done, particularly with trees. If you've got tree diseases, you will often see a common treatment is systemic. And what you do is you put that liquid in the, the soil, you put it around the tree in many cases, and the roots will now absorb that, that treatment into the system of the plant. It's a systemic treatment. And then once it gets inside the tree and then spreads out to the leaves, it will often be a way to kill or at least reduce the impact of that disease on that tree. Copper is a compound that's commonly used to treat diseases in a number of plants. So in our vegetable garden, if you're looking to get rid of, of fungal diseases, you might see copper in the compound that you're using. I, again, because I don't have a big disease problem, haven't used a lot of those. If I see something starting to set in and I suspect it, and I look and see that uh, maybe it's an early blight or a late blight on tomatoes, often you can just cut off those branches and keep it from spreading. Mulch on the soil can also help a lot with soil-borne diseases. It has to get from the soil onto the plant. And often it's from wet leaves and wet soil and rainy conditions and watering. And you have spores from some of these fungal diseases that might be resting on the soil that bounce onto wet leaves and can cause a disease to develop in that plant. Yet another great reason why you should mulch to keep those spores from bouncing onto your leaves. And another great reason why you shouldn't overhead water your plants. You should try to keep your plants as, as dry as possible, the leaves, because wet leaves are more likely to have viral and fungal diseases develop. But that's not always the case because powdery mildew, which is very common and pretty much all around us, those spores are blowing through the wind almost everywhere, almost every day. That's actually going to happen on dry leaves in most situations. It's a lack of air circulation on plants that are packed close together that have poor air circulation that's going to cause most of our powdery mildew problems. So I don't overhead water my cucumbers and squashes at all. And in most years, late in the season, I'll get powdery mildew. And why is that late in the season? Because early in the season, I'm pruning the plants, I'm keeping good air circulation, I'm keeping the powdery mildew from develop. And then late in the season, I just get tired and lazy and the plant's overgrown and it's getting to the nearer the, the end of its life and I just let it go and powdery mildew sets in. So understanding the life cycle of your plants and when diseases are most likely to attack is also an important factor. On tomatoes, there's a reason they call it early blight and late blight, separate diseases. Early blight happens early in the life of a tomato plant, can often be stopped. 
late blight happens late in the season and often is reason to pull the plant. So learn more about the specific diseases as you identify them. So offline, I can't give the specific answer as to what those brown spots are other than to check out and see if you can identify it uh, as a particular type of disease. And then from there, you should be able to move forward with an idea of how you might want to uh, approach it or treat it and, and deal with it at that point. Speak Life Garden Homestead and Permaculture. I'm not growing like all my tomatoes together, for instance. Rather, I'm putting them peppered in the area I'm growing in amongst various plants. My attempt to test soil areas and hope one thrives. Great idea. And, and I've got tomatoes growing, currently growing in four different beds. And I still have some tomatoes in pots that I want to put into another uh, new bed, new, battle, new metal bed that I haven't filled with soil yet. And I did, and that's one of the reasons I do that is is growing in different areas, and and so when something like a tomato plant that we all like to grow, grow them in different areas, and partly to find out which area is best, but also if diseases enter your garden and start attacking your tomatoes, by spreading out your tomato plants, and this holds true for everything else, spreading out the plants into different beds. The other beds are less likely to be infected if disease does find its way into your garden. And that's that's one of those things I've done for years and years, and it actually works pretty well. Okay, I, I do want to uh, also mention about how the diseases can spread. Uh, I talked about the insects as being one way, the... The, the wind will blow things in like the powdery mildew. I, I don't do much to try to prevent it from happening because I just know it's going to happen. And there are a lot of fungal diseases like that that are just going to happen. You may not even be aware of it. There are fungal diseases that will happen late in the season that you just don't even see. And you move forward, you pull the plant, you throw it in the compost, and it's not a soil-borne disease, so it doesn't become a problem the next year. It's those soil-borne problems that you need to be most concerned about in growing the same plant in the same soil. One of the, the ways that, that you probably don't hear talked about much is seeds, spreading diseases through your seeds. Now, I'm a huge advocate of saving seed. There are some diseases. There are, there are more viral and more bacterial diseases than fungal diseases, but there are diseases that can be spread by planting a seed from an infected plant. And so the, the idea of saving seeds is great, but I caution against saving the seed of a plant you know to be infected. I like to grow from seed and I like to save my seed. And that's one way I work to keep my garden disease free. Most of the, the, the sources I get seeds from, I know to be good sources and I suspect that their, their seeds are disease free. But occasionally I'll take seeds from a fellow gardener and put them in my garden. And it's possible that those seeds could be contaminated. When you save your seeds, only save from the good plants. If you get seeds, only buy from a reputable company. And if you get them from gardeners, ideally you'll get them from a gardener who knows what they're doing before you put the seeds in the garden. You can actually, if, if you suspect your seed might possibly be carrying a disease, you can do a chlorine treatment. You can do chlorine bleach. Typically, you'll use one part of bleach to four parts of water. You soak your seeds in it. You agitate it. It only takes a couple minutes, and, and that chlorine can actually kill the viruses and the bacteria that might be on that seed. That's a possibility. Better yet, it's just avoid the whole issue. If you suspect your seeds might have a disease, don't use them. Get seeds from another source. Get them from someplace that you know is disease-free, and that way you're not going to be introducing the diseased plants to your garden through the seed that you or somebody else saved. Hi, Tony. Nice to see you here today. Simplify Gardening. And most of you know Tony O'Neill's channel. And uh, I, I, 
I think most of you, or a lot of you at least, are subscribers. But if you're not, check out Tony's Simplified Gardening channel. Lots of great stuff. Um, I hope you're feeling well, mate. T Tony has been um, dealing with some recovery, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing new videos soon. And thank you, Tony, for that that super chat. And uh, I, I, I love what you do. I love what I do, and I appreciate that contribution. Thank you. It's very welcome. Uh, I, Few, gosh, has it been two months now that, that Tony's uh, book on composting came out, the Composting Masterclass book? I think it's been almost two months now. So another great resource and composting to to tie into to Tony's Composting Masterclass book is a good way. If you can have a hot compost pile, and we're talking a compost pile that is 140 degrees and higher, 60 degrees Celsius and higher. That's hot enough to kill the bacteria and the fungi and the the viruses that are going to be on the plant material. So if you're making your own compost, that's a good way to help ensure that the plants aren't spreading disease. If you buy your compost and it hasn't been composted at those high temperatures, Compost could be a way that diseases are introduced into your garden. And I know a couple gardeners that, that I've talked to over the years who can't explain how disease got into their garden. They're doing everything right. The plants are healthy. They're pulling the diseased plants as soon as they see them. And then diseases find their way into the garden. And asking the question, do you make your own compost or do you buy compost? Buying compost can be one of those ways to to introduce some of those those diseases the the good manufacturers of compost are usually making it at high temperatures often they're sterilizing the mix when they put it into the bag looking into that also is beneficial for you to to help lessen some of your concerns and maybe your fears about that but making your own compost and having a hot compost pile is a great way to try to reduce diseases into the garden. And if you buy your plants from a nursery, or I would say more likely a big box store, you could potentially be introducing diseases in your garden. If that plant was grown in a greenhouse that had a disease, and especially if it was a soil-borne disease, or if it was uh, insect-borne disease and now that plant has some of those insects on it when you buy it and put it into your garden that's one way you might be introducing diseases into your garden as well so look at the whole picture when you're trying to combat diseases in the garden and and I think the first line of defense is just to keep it from finding your garden and by recognizing that compost and soil and insects are are ways that, that they can find your garden. Hopefully that enlightens you a little bit to at least take a few extra precautions, maybe a little bit extra time in deciding how you get your plants. And in my healthy garden, once I know the plants are healthy and I save my seed, I can use that same seed year after year and I don't have to rely on a source that might cause a problem. So try to do it all myself if I can. And I encourage all of you, the more you garden, try to do more and more of, of what you're relying on others for. And then eventually, hopefully you can get to that diseased uh, or disease-free garden point. So there's Jay on top of things as always, a nice link to, to Tony's book. So check that out because it is an, an a wonderful, wonderful book. Laurelful saying the one rule of composting is to use the materials as mulch, spread evenly over the garden, and it's all done. No more steps needed. Yeah, and and I've talked about that. I I completely agree with you. I actually uh, is to, or well, you actually you saw it if you watched the the video I did last week about the the survival garden tasks. I do a lot of that. If I pull up weeds, if I'm pruning off the leaves, if I'm thinning out my plants. I, I use all of that material as mulch, just chop and drop in place. Don't do that if it's a diseased plant. If you are pruning off the diseased branches and diseased leaves, don't drop those on top of the soil as a mulch. But for most others, 
yes, I completely agree with you. That's one of those things uh, to to do. It, and <laughs> I'll agree with Tony. Uh, I don't do it with everything. The big stuff I do put in the compost. I think compost, uh, you need to have compost and you need a lot of material for compost. So when I'm just doing a little weed pulling and a little pruning, I drop it. But when I'm doing a lot of plant pulling or clearing out the garden, that's all the stuff that goes into the compost. So Tony's right. You need to be putting that the big stuff and a lot of stuff and make the compost if you can. SC is saying composting at home is one of the most eco-friendly activities that can save the planet. Yeah, and in this context, not only save the planet, but you're saving the planet by saving your own garden. And so if we can all save our gardens, one garden at a time, yeah, ultimately it, it, it's going to save the planet on so many more levels than just, just the diseases. So it's one of those things to, to continue moving forward. And, and so Tony, just ask. I'll get you on the channel soon. T Tony and I toss ideas back and forth from time to time as to what collaboration videos we do. And so I was talking earlier, I think probably before Tony got here, I mentioned the, the, the rotating of the crops if you have a disease, but not rotating the crop if you don't have diseases. And Tony and I did a collaboration video, uh, I think it was last year, it might have been longer ago than that, where we talked about that as an issue. Where neither of us rotate our crops for the nutrient reasons because our soils are good but we will both rotate our crops as needed if a disease enters the way so uh laura full is asking it's a little bit earlier than i normally do it but let's go ahead and talk about it now the background this comes from kelly alberts and so uh let's talk about some of the things and also see if i can tie some of the practices that you're seeing here into disease prevention in the garden because i see a lot of good things so kelly's garden uh, you can see uh right here this this is like the stairs going up to a deck i'm guessing and so a lot is packed into this garden space and so take your time to take a look at what's some of the things that's happening back here you can see the trellises that are supported by the fence in front of that you can see these tp trellises You've got this archway trellis. Over here, you've got just these, these stick trellises. Lots of different options. I like to use trellises of all different types depending on the plants. And it looks like that's exactly what Kelly is doing in the garden. So great example of that. One of the things I wanted to point out, and, and again, you have to kind of look close to see it. So small garden space, many of us who are gardening in a small garden space are, are doing our vegetable garden there. At the end of the season, we clean it out, which is a great thing to keep diseases from passing because a lot of diseases will overwinter in the plant material. And so clean out your garden, keep your garden as clean as possible if, if you suspect or if you've encountered disease. And then the next year we start all over again. Well, hidden in this picture, which I think is awesome, is a tree back here. So. Not sure exactly, I can't quite tell, but that's probably an apple tree, I'm guessing, in the background. You see this archway? Well, look at the base of the arch tree. These are small little pine or, or spruce trees. That's a permanent addition to the garden. And then you see these pots. I'm guessing this plant will grow up onto the archway. And those bigger pots, those may be perennial plants. So even in a small garden, you can set up trees and you know these are probably dwarf conifers and then have this structure with the plants that will fill that structure and you don't have to start over every single year even in a small space you can start thinking in terms of the perennial plants and reducing your workload by having a place that is going to be the same for years to come this arch isn't going anywhere you can see these t posts that are anchoring it right here. That looks to me to be a pretty permanent structure. And then hidden at the top is a lantern. And it, it looks like it's a battery operated lantern. A few weeks back, I talked about lighting the garden at night. So this is a nice space that Kelly can walk through. There's some light, there's some permanent space. And then there's beds of all different types. A lot of container gardens, a lot of pots down here in this corner. Over in this corner, look at this, whole garden 
made with five gallon buckets. And this is a great idea if you're limited by space and, and sun, because that's, that's a big limitation when we're trying to garden. We want to garden a lot, but we might not have enough space in our yard that gets good sun. Look what they've done here. This is a tier. These are like stair steps. And so they have their grow bags and they have their five gallon buckets growing at different levels so that they can all get the sun. So a relatively small footprint, but by growing the container, the bucket or the bag at a different height, now you can ensure that these plants at the top are getting as much light as the plants at the bottom. So lots of good stuff here. I, I, I really liked uh, this picture from Kelly because you can see a lot of plants. You can see different methods of gardening. You've got these raised beds that are relatively permanent, and then you have these pots all over the place. And so when we talk about diseases in the garden, growing in containers can be a great way to mitigate diseases. If you live in a region that is susceptible to diseases, if every gardener you know has the same disease, you might wanna start gardening in containers. And then if the plant in that container gets diseased, it's easy to dump. It's easy to start over with that container and a new plant. What I didn't mention earlier when, when we were talking about the soil, I didn't mention replacing the soil because in an in-ground bed or a raised bed, it can be difficult to replace the soil if you you realize you have a disease that resides in the soil. And so that's why rotating the crops if, if, the, if the disease is in the soil can be uh, a remedy. But if you're growing in all of these different pots and the plant is infected with one of those soil-borne diseases, you can replace the soil. You can just dump the soil out. You can go through the process of sterilizing it if you choose and or put new soil into that container and it's disease free and you move forward. So I love container gardening. I love when I see gardens like Kelly's that shows that you can grow an awful lot of plants in containers. And this is one of those things you can do to mitigate and treat the diseases that might appear in your garden. And so Tony's saying, be mindful of the potting mix. Some of the stuff in the UK is dreadful at the moment. I've been testing it on my potatoes and it's not looking good. Yeah, Tony had a video um, last month, I believe it was, where the, the potatoes look great, but he was talking about how it doesn't think he's going to get a good potato harvest this year because of the dreadful soil. And so uh, in, in all cases, it helps to know the source of your soil. And if you start seeing a problem, you recognize that it could be the soil that is the cause. And you may be doing everything right. I get questions like this all the time from people. They're doing everything right and wondering why the plant is suffering or why that's not flowering or why they're not getting the harvest. And it could be the soil. Soil causes lots of problems to include diseases. And so if you've done everything you can do and nothing is working, if you haven't looked at the soil first, well then stop, go back, look at the soil. And that may be the reason that some of the, the problems are, are, are encountering in your garden. Okay, let's see, Paul saying, a friend of mine keeps horses and I love to keep a truckload full of manure from her, but I'm scared to death of amino pyrrolids. And so um, I have a, a video about this where I talk about the straw and contaminated straw. Uh, what, and, and, and actually I have another video where I talk about a mending bed. So what I do with my manures and with my straw. So last year, it's been over a year ago now, I got a load of steer manure and I kept it in a pile in my garden for a year. And most of the the herbicides that those amino pyrrolids that would contaminate the feed that the horses or in this case the steer might eat and might be in the manure after a year they're going to dissipate and the same with straw all of the straw i'm using in my garden this year 
I bought a year ago. Left it outside, they were exposed to the rain and the sun and the snow. And so I, I think in most cases that it's okay to use manures if you let them age and, and spend time outside. It's the same with the diseases. It's possible the diseases could be spread in manures, but if it's been weathered, the sun is a very effective killer of a lot of the pathogens that could find their way into the garden. The UV rays of the sun are great at, at killing the, the viruses and the bacteria and even some of the viruses, the, the fungi, the bacteria, and some of the viruses that, that might be spread through the manure. Spread it out in the sun and let the sun kill it all through the UV rays over time and then use it. So hopefully your concerns might be lessened a little bit if you give yourself some time and just let that manure age. And then it, it's kind of a, 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 a double prong attack. You let the manure age and then you add the manure to the compost pile and the process of composting will also mitigate any of those concerns with both diseases and those chemicals like aminopyrrolins. The bacteria, there's a lot of bacteria, and, and if you look into it, a lot of these, these herbicides, once they hit the soil, there are bacteria in the soil that will neutralize many of those chemicals. It's incredible. In the compost pile, a lot of those bacteria will do the same thing. So there you go, Jay's right on top of it. Uh, video about herbicide contamination, and it's most specifically talking about things like straw, but uh, it also holds true for the manures as well. Okay, let's see. Gardens Happen says you can also plant corn and manure to help get rid of stuff like pesticides and herbicides. Good point. Excellent point. And so most of those herbicides that we might be concerned about are, are leafy plant herbicides. They're designed to, to kill the weeds that are growing and most of the weeds in those those big agricultural operations are, are leafy, broad leaf plants. And so the herbicides are designed to kill the broad leaf plants. And that's what's being transferred. If you grow grasses, they're not going to be impacted. And that's basically what corn is. So you can grow corn in that soil that is either mulched with a straw that might be contaminated or is amended with manure that might be contaminated. There are a lot of plants like corn that won't be affected at all. So yeah, it's a good point. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Hi, Ronald. Thank you for that donation. Hey, Gardner Scott, how do you deal with harlequin bugs? They are brutally attacking my kale. Hey, Brandy, love you. <laughs> Thanks for that. So um, the, the last, it, it's funny you should ask this. Now it's been six years ago now. Uh, yeah, six years ago. The last major pest infestation that I had in my garden was harlequin bugs. Now, it was at the, the school garden, the Galileo School Garden, and we had thousands of harlequin bugs. And we used to get the students out, and we would spend a whole class period, 45 minutes, doing nothing more than just plucking off the harlequin bugs and putting them into a bag and then putting the bags in the freezer to kill the bugs and then the students could look at the dead bugs afterwards. So hand picking we did and that had impact but not a lot of impact. And it was one of those things that the whole season we had harlequin bugs. Beautiful bug. Harlequin bug is really a beautiful bug to look at. But they really like brassicas in particular. In that garden, they were attacking the turnips, if I remember right, and just everywhere. But it gets back to what I was talking about earlier in the show, healthy plants versus weak plants. So that bed that was infested by thousands of harlequin bugs, those plants were the weakest, the same plant in beds three beds away so so we would grow in in a hundred beds at that school garden and and like i talked about earlier where i spread tomatoes in my garden two different beds we did the same thing at the school garden so that year i think we were actually growing in 80 
different beds. And the plants we were growing were staggered throughout the garden. Same plants, different beds. The harlequin bugs attacked one bed in particular and left all the others alone. So I let that bed die. I let those plants die a slow death with all those harlequin bugs because the harlequin bugs didn't attack any of the other beds because those plants were stronger and healthier. And I knew once the harlequin bugs started becoming overwhelming that I needed to focus on those other turnip plants and the brassicas to try to keep the, the harlequin bugs at bay. And if one happened to show up on one of those other plants, we were on top of it. So inspecting the whole garden became a daily activity to keep the harlequin bugs from spreading. But another big factor at, in the, the year after that, first off, I started growing more ornamental grasses and flowers to attract the predators. And there aren't a lot of predators to, to bugs like that and to a lot of beetles. But I started attracting more predators to the garden, predators that might be eating the eggs of the harlequin bugs. I started recognizing what the eggs looked like. So if we saw eggs on the plant, we immediately squished and rubbed off the eggs so they didn't spread. And like I said, we tried to capture and kill as many of the adults as possible so that they wouldn't lay the eggs. The next year, after encouraging the predators, after killing as many adults as possible, we didn't see a single harlequin bug. Not one. And so some of that is environmental. We also just tossed all of those plants into the compost, had a nice hot compost pile, killed any eggs that might have attempted to overwinter on those plants. We amended the soil, we turned over the soil. That was, that's another good way to, to deal with some of the diseases and some of those pests is turning the soil. Now, no dig gardening is a great way to garden. But if you expose the soil to sunlight, to that, those UV rays, if you put in the compost and you turn the soil, now you're also helping to, to increase the bacteria life in the soil that might combat those diseases. And you're also exposing some of the soil that wasn't previously exposed to UV rays to the UV rays, and that can also kill some of those, those problem areas. So we did all of that and got rid of the harlequin bug. So hopefully, Ronald, that gives you a few ideas. Um, it was a lot of work. It was one of those things that we were, we spent days and many hours plucking off the harlequin bugs to keep them at bay. And ultimately it worked. We didn't have the issue the, the next year. So give that some thought. Maybe that's one of those things that you'll be able to, uh, to, to fix. And there'll be a problem this year, but it's, I, I'm always looking to next year. There are a lot of these kind of problems, the diseases and the pests that happen. If you can nip it in the bud, almost literally, this year, then in the future, you won't have that problem. Hi, Yvonne. There are tiny bites in sweet potato plant leaves. Not enough for me to worry about. Am I ignoring a potential problem that can weaken the plant and cause disease? Uh, you're not ignoring it because you're aware of it. And so that's that's the, the, the first recognition is that you've seen the little holes. The next step is identification. Try to figure out what's causing those holes, be it flea beetles or who knows what could be causing those type of little holes. But try to identify the culprit. And then when you identify the culprit, you can determine if that pest, if that insect is a carrier for a particular type of disease. And that may influence what kind of controls you have to do. But yes, also recognizing that plants that are eaten typically are going to be weaker. And so try to keep the other plants as strong as possible. You can't always strengthen a weakened plant to the point that it's going to be able to fight off whatever continues to attack it. But you can use that information on the rest of your plants to keep them growing healthy, to keep the, the watering on a, a, a good cycle so that the soil is always moist and to, to keep the air circulation so that other diseases like powdery mildew don't set in and to, to keep the plants growing healthy. Recognize the problem plants 
and work to keep the other plants nice and healthy. And it might just be that you've just got tiny little bites on your leaves that won't cause any problem whatsoever. It's one of those things that uh, they, I saw a, a meme this last week that said something along the lines of if your plants or if your leaves don't have holes in them, then you don't have a healthy garden. And I agree with that. Part of the balance of nature in our garden is that we allow some of those pests. Those pests need to be there because the predators that also need to be there need food. And so, yeah, leaves get eaten. But the bugs that are eating those leaves will also get eaten. And that's, that's what I'm after, is those predators that are going to eat the bad bugs before they create a big problem. And, and I've, I've seen that. So last year, I did a video. I talked about it on the live stream. I had a, a bush in, on my driveway infested by aphids. And then the ladybugs came and got rid of the aphids. And so I've got a pretty good ladybug population now in my yard, in my garden. And I didn't have an aphid problem this year. Now, it could be the weather. We had a crazy dry and hot spring. And so that could help explain why we didn't have the aphids. But but I had I don't have aphids in my garden this year. And I think part of it is weather, but part of it is also the predators are in my garden now. Because last year, I allowed the aphids in my garden so that I could create the good populations that are going to balance out my garden in the long run. So... Uh, let's see what else we have. Laura G. Young is saying the hoppers are eating my raspberries and I don't know what I can still use the half eaten ones. So uh, much of it is cosmetic and uh, with the leaves. Uh, so spinach, for instance, uh, spinach and lettuce are plants that are eaten by all kinds of different insects, completely edible. You can still eat those leaves. They just have holes in them. They just don't look pretty. They don't look like the lettuce and the spinach that we buy at the store. It's the same with raspberries. It's the same with most fruits, depending on the fruit and the insect. It damages it. It might not look pretty, but it's just a bug. And if, if you're willing to, to kiss your significant other on the mouth, then you're probably okay eating a fruit or leaf that an insect munched on. It's going to be less less uh, hazard to your health than kissing another person. Don't worry about the bugs. It's one of those things that it happens. If 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 it bothers you that that you've got bug spittle on the raspberry, then yeah, don't eat it. But no, you should be able to to eat the half eaten ones without too much difficulty, and it really shouldn't cause a problem. I do it all the time. Um, I do now. Granted, I'm I'm kind of on the border of this, but strawberries. I'll I'll be out in the garden and I'll pick a strawberry and I'll see that the strawberry has some holes in it, usually from a bird, occasionally from a slug. I'll I'll bite off the hole and spit it back into the bed and then eat the rest of the strawberry. So so yes, I do have some issue with that. It's it's purely mental. There's no reason for it, but I do bite off that eaten portion, but I'll eat the rest of it. And really, you could eat the whole thing, even if it has a, a hole from a bird or a slug, you can still eat the whole thing and, and it shouldn't cause any problem. So uh, consider that urban chicken mama. I made a sandwich for my ex's sister from the garden. She found a bug and flipped out. Yeah, my kids, in fact, um, I think it was my son reminded me of this uh, relatively recently, years ago, growing broccoli. And, and I was new. I was a new gardener, so excited to to grow broccoli and have it be successful. So harvested the broccoli and and cut cut the the heads of the broccoli into you know smaller pieces like you do and put it into a pot for uh, for cooking. And uh, little green caterpillars were floating on the surface. Same type of thing. When you put the broccoli in the boiling water, it's going to kill those little caterpillars and they're going to float to the surface. The broccoli is completely edible. But since that point, my my kids in particular won't eat any broccoli that I grow in the garden because broccoli has bugs in it and they don't want to eat a bug. I get it. 
You don't have to eat the bug, but you can eat what the bug has eaten and it's okay. And flipping out is a normal reaction. So uh, I, I, I think that can actually be a nice story to tell and share with the, the, the gardening community after that point is feeding people caterpillars from your garden. Now, if you've ever eaten a caterpillar, have you ever had a chocolate covered caterpillar? They're actually pretty good. A lot of those insects you can actually eat. So even if you do eat the insects, it's not a big deal. And if those insects are carrying a plant disease and you eat those insects, or if they happen to chew on one of those leaves and one of those plant diseases happens to be on that leaf and then you eat that leaf, you're gonna be okay. Plant diseases are different than people diseases. And so don't worry about working with those plants and thinking that you might expose yourself to some type of disease. Yes, you're exposing yourself to a disease that you might transfer to another plant, but it's not going to impact you. And so that's that's the next area to, to start talking about. You could potentially also be a spreader of disease. Now, you see this a lot, and, and I've actually mentioned uh, a while back, I was talking about my raspberries, and I'm, I'm growing red raspberries, yellow raspberries, and black raspberries in the same plot. And I had a question on the live stream from someone asking about the black raspberries because the prevailing wisdom is you don't grow black raspberries near the other raspberries because the black raspberries are more susceptible to the diseases. Well, if you have a garden like mine that is disease-free, I haven't brought in any diseases, and, and I'm not worried about the diseases, I'm growing those different raspberries side by side, and I don't have an issue with it. If you have diseases and you put plants that are susceptible to that disease nearby, you could potentially cause the spread of the disease into those new plants. You'll also see that, that if you're pruning, and this is old school pruning, that you're supposed to prune like a fruit tree and then sterilize the pruners between cuts. Well, that operates under the assumption that there are diseases in that orchard, in that garden, and by cutting one branch, if that branch is diseased and you cut another branch, well, that disease could have been transferred on the pruner and you've now infected another branch. And if you cut the branch off one tree and then move on to another tree without sterilizing the pruner, you could be transferring that disease to a new tree. That's, that's how the transmission of some of these diseases work. Now, I've never sterilized my pruners or secateurs between pruning cuts. And I move from one plant to another without even thinking about sterilizing it because I don't have those disease issues. So there are some things that we learn to do in gardening to prevent disease that I think once you learn about it just becomes an extra unnecessary step if you don't have those diseases recognizing what you have and what you don't have can make gardening much, much easier. Now, if you want to sterilize your pruners between every cut all the time, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't hurt anything. If you're sterilizing with bleach over time, that bleach can erode the metal in your pruners, but it's not going to harm anything else. So if you're doing it already, go ahead and keep doing it. Just recognize the reason that you've been told to do it is to prevent disease or to prevent spreading disease and if you don't have the disease in the first place then it's it's something you really don't need to worry about okay let's see terry hall saying i found toads cooling off in the soil of my sweet potatoes and was wondering uh if they will bother my sweet potatoes i don't think it's a bother at all in fact that's awesome the toads are actually awesome at controlling some of those pests in your garden so I would, I would ask instead, how do you get the, 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 the toads to, to spread to other areas? And uh, it's one of those kind of things that, no, they're not, they're not going to bother your sweet potatoes. In fact, what they're going to do is eat some of those pests that might bother your sweet potatoes. 
And so welcome them, give them a, a toad house and give them a water source. I did that with my son who lives in Louisiana. I actually gave him a toad house as a housewarming gift and he had toads living in it because they're wonderful for the yard and for the garden because they just eat a ton of insects. So uh, don't, yeah, don't worry about the, uh, the bother of the sweet potatoes. Encourage them and be glad that you've got a, a garden that's becoming healthy enough to support the, the toads. That's fantastic. We don't have toads and frogs in my area, uh, except about once every 15 years because it's just so dry. The house I lived at about 15 years ago we had a very wet, wet season. And in the back of the property, a pond suddenly developed. There hadn't been a pond there before, and there was never a pond there afterwards. But that year, there was so much rain that a pond actually developed. And we had frogs and toads. And so you may have seen some of those documentaries about these, these toads that'll bury themselves in the mud and then reemerge years later. I suspect we have some of those here in Colorado because I've never seen as many frogs and toads as we had that year before or since. And uh, I wish I could entice some of those to my garden because they really are good. A, a great way to deal with some of those insect pests that we don't necessarily want to deal with or don't know how to deal with. Nature does it with lizards and toads and snakes and a lot of those animals that, that will find their way into that healthy garden, the healthy biosphere of plants and animals that you have in your garden. That, that's really a good thing. Yeah, Tony's actually right. Uh, absolutely. Spiders are good for your garden too. Uh, my my daughter has, I've, I've mentioned this before, my daughter actually goes out of her way to, to save spiders, as do I. And so spiders are definitely good for the garden. Add them to the list of the ones that, that will be beneficial and take care of some of those pests that you have. So Laura's got Woodhouse Toads in Fort Collins. That's up the road from me, about a, an hour, hour and a half away, but lives near a creek. Yeah, I wish I lived near a creek. There aren't a lot of creeks on this side of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And there you go. Herb and Chicken Mama's got a ton of frogs. So it's one of those things that uh, you might not notice the correlation. If you have a lot of insects, take a look at the things that you don't have, like the spiders and the toads and the frogs and the snakes and all of those predatory insects. If you don't have a lot of insect problem and you notice you have all of those animals, well, that's the correlation. They, they definitely work together. So, Okay, let's see. Mayday Gardens got toads in Arizona. The school fields are covered with them when they emerge. That's awesome. So uh, I wish we did. And lizards. I live in a very dry area. If we go into the rocky areas, the, the, the mountainy and hilly areas with all the rocks, there are lizards. But I've yet to see a lizard in my garden. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed on all of that. Patty says, all of our three plum trees are infected with black spot. It is dacanil fungicide. Um, with that particular ingredient safe to use, we're high above a huge creek. Thanks for your help. Glad to help. Um, so I can't speak specifically to that fungicide. Take a look at the 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 label. The, the, the fungicides should have the label that tells you everything you need to know about the safety of it. It'll tell you how to use it, whether it's safe for animals and people. Uh, and and often the, the, the good companies will tell you uh, about its impact on the environment with uh, water, whether it can contaminate water and contaminate other plants. So I can't speak specifically to that. So so read the, lab, the label and look at the warnings that are on the label for that fungicide, and it should answer your questions. If you don't have the label or you don't see it on the label, then, then go ahead and do an internet search, and it should tell you the answers that you're looking for. Uh, most of the things we use in our garden uh, in general are safe for us, but there are some things on for trees and for orchards that are systemic, like that one probably is, and uh, you have to be careful. Sometimes they can contaminate the water supply and they might give warnings like wear gloves or apply it on a, a windless day. 
you know, th there's those kind of things that you do need to be aware of when you when you spread the the fungicides or whatever you're trying to do to prevent some of these problems. Ash M, thank you for that. Love your channel so much. Thank you. I have some beneficial nematodes I purchased, but the label says vaguely that they attack caterpillars, but it's a pollinator garden. Should I avoid them? So um, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. So nematodes are a soil animal. And so, the, and the caterpillars are going to be uh, above the soil. And so, yes, there are, there are some nematodes, and apparently this is one that, that could attack a caterpillar, but, but I'm guessing that the way that you're supposed to um, spread the nematodes is either on the soil or underneath the mulch or actually incorporate them into the soil, which is more likely. And then look at the caterpillars you have, because caterpillars tend to be uh, focused on a host plant. And so the monarch butterflies are among the most famous in the United States that will, will eat the milkweed plant. So, so you grow milkweed to attract the monarch butterfly. So if you that kind of pollinator, pollinator garden where you're enticing very specific butterflies and you know what plants they're going to be eating, then I would say go ahead and maybe avoid those nematodes in areas where you know the caterpillars are going to be eating that plant. I suspect it's one of those things that the caterpillar that is eating the plant close to the ground and then the, no, the nematodes might uh, infect the caterpillar and that's what causes the, the problem. And so caterpillars that are eating high up on the plant are probably never going to be exposed to those nematodes. Uh, and yet again, another reason for mulch. It should be that if these are the nematodes you're putting into the soil and then you have mulch on top of it, now that's an interface to keep the caterpillars and the nematodes from ever uh, responding to each other. And I, I don't think that'd be a problem. But I wouldn't necessarily um, avoid them. You just might want to be a little careful about how you use them. And so use them maybe in your vegetable garden and not in your pollinator garden. If you have a problem with nematodes in your pollinator garden, then, or not with nematodes, but if you have a problem with some of the grubs that are in the pollinator garden, because typically the nematodes are used to attract the beetle larva. So if you have a problem with those grubs, that beetle larva in your, your pollinator garden, then yes, absolutely use them. But if the reason you have them is because of the grubs in your vegetable garden, then you probably don't have a need to, to put them in your pollinator garden. Uh, so, uh, and if they do attack caterpillars, um, it's probably only gonna be a few and it's probably gonna be, I'm guessing, pretty rare. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would continue to use the nematodes as you planned to use the nematodes. And if you happen to, to lose a few caterpillars along the way, again, that's all part of the way nature works. You happen to lose a couple caterpillars. You know, there are worse things that can happen. The butterflies are great. Attracting those pollinators are great, but there are a lot of other pollinators than the butterflies or the moths that would be coming from those particular caterpillars. So go for it and uh, hopefully don't try to, to worry too much about it. So let's see, um, Dr. Trot saying, stopped growing milkweed. The skink lizards just ate the caterpillars. Oh, that is sad. And and so <laughs> lizards are a good thing, but like we're talking about with the good caterpillars, the caterpillars we want for the the, the butterflies and moths, uh, and that's funny, I've never heard anyone say that before, that the lizards eat the caterpillars and, and, and you're trying to get the caterpillars. So I'm sorry to hear that, that's something new. That's a good story to, to pass on as well. Uh, okay, let's see. National Jones is saying here in Canada, we used to have millions of monarch butterflies. I've not seen one for 20 years now. Yeah, I in fact, I've got um, more milkweed that I'm planting. So I've got it in three different areas of my garden right now. I'm planting more, got a couple different varieties. I haven't seen a monarch butterfly. Uh, it, it, it's, it could be at, at least 20 years, but at least I'm trying. And, and if they happen to to migrate through this area, hopefully my garden can be a resting spot for them. But 
yeah, as you probably know, the Monarch numbers are dramatically reduced. Uh, I saw that this last year was actually a pretty good year in Mexico, which is a major spot. And some of the spots in California are major spots for Monarchs. And they've actually had some population increases. So let's hope the populations continue to increase and gardeners like us are, are planting milkweed. And, uh, and you can still plant the milkweed even with the, the skink lizards. Uh, you know, same type of thing. Maybe they're going to crowd around one plant, but if you grow it in different areas, maybe some of those caterpillars might actually find their way into the garden and you'll be able to, to save some of them. Laura says you can take caterpillars and rear them in a mesh cage to protect them if they're getting eaten by lizards. Yeah, that's, you know, I don't think they do that in school much anymore. Back in my day, that used to be one of those activities that we would do in school where we would take the caterpillars and the leaves and put them in a, an aquarium and watch the process as they form the chrysalis and then they emerged as a butterfly. Great opportunity to teach kids about the life in the garden, but uh, I, I don't see a lot of that anymore. You can actually buy some of those caterpillars uh, and they'll ship them to you and you can put them in the aquarium and watch the same thing happen. So that is a lot of fun and it is very beneficial. Pablo says caterpillars ate the habanero plants. So uh, if you have caterpillars that you don't want, like in your vegetable garden, yes, absolutely deal with them. Pluck them off. I've had a lot of people commenting with me recently, and I just bought a little black light flashlight to go out to my garden at night and try to see the caterpillars. There's something attacking my tomatoes and so I'm going to go out with my black light, try to find the caterpillars and pluck the caterpillars off. But uh, what, nematodes are a great natural, organic way to deal with those soil-borne larvae. A, a wonderful way that you can use bacteria to your benefit is with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. And you can buy BT that you sprinkle on your leaves. And when the caterpillar eat the leaves, it's going to kill the caterpillars. Not instantly. It, it messes up with their digestive system, but it'll kill the caterpillars. And so BT is a great way to deal with caterpillars. Um, I actually have BT on hand for that purpose. I don't just spread it around my garden willy-nilly. But if I happen to see a problem starting to develop, I've got the BT all ready to go. So that's one of those things you can have in your toolkit, so to speak and deal with some of those those insects that eat the leaves like caterpillars, especially if you're trying to, to grow peppers for a good harvest, make some hot sauce maybe. Um, yeah, deal with those caterpillars as soon as you can. May Day Garden says in the San Joaquin Valley, and that's in California, the milkweed is soft as lamb's ear. I've seen other varieties where leaves are smooth. Yeah, so the variety I have is smooth. And so Milkweeds tend to fall. You've got a, a swamp milkweed, actually, that grows in very wet regions. Uh, mine is, is sold as butterfly weed, but, but it's a milkweed that grows in dry regions. And so that's a big difference in the varieties is, is where they grow, how much water they need. And yeah, like a lot of plants, you're going to see variation in their leaves. And they're still milkweed. They're just, that might be a showy milkweed or a swamp milkweed or... A butterfly weed, milkweed, uh, but they're, they're all good. And, and it, in many cases, they've got beautiful, beautiful flowers, which is another great one to, um, to, to have in the garden. And so I'm, I'm continuing to grow more. Riverdale Gardens uses BT on the brassicas. And, and that's another one of those things. It's a bacteria, but it's not, it doesn't harm humans. And so you can spread it. It, it devastates caterpillars, but it's not anything to har harm you. So yeah, on your on your brassicas, uh, go ahead and spread some BT and then wash off and cook or eat raw after you've washed it. And it's one way to, to deal with the problem and not harm yourself in the process. So that, that's actually a pretty good way to, to deal with it. Uh, okay, let's see. John Jude says, I have a bush called butterfly bush that if 10, mark, 10 monarchs flying by, eight will come to maybe plant milk among it. So, um, and so butterfly bushes are, are a little bit different than the butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is uh, the, the milk weed, 
whereas a butterfly bush is a completely different type of plant. So the butterflies are being attracted to the flowers. And this is this gets to garden design. And, and I actually just planted some, some new butterfly bushes uh, in the area near where I'm growing my butterfly weed. So the butterfly bush that has thousands of flowers will help attract the butterflies to include the monarchs, hopefully. And then once the butterflies come to the garden, they'll see all the other plants. And if I'm growing the host plant, so the, the reason milkweed is important is because that's the plant that the monarch butterfly is going to lay the eggs on. And so they're attracted to the butterfly bush. But if you have that milkweed growing nearby, then that's where the monarch could possibly lay eggs and you could increase the population of the monarchs in your garden. And so, uh, yeah, growing bushes like that that attract the butterflies and then nearby planting the milkweed is really the, the goal. If you plant just milkweed by itself, it, it's probably going to be lost by the butterflies flying over. But if you got lots of other pollinator plants, you're really increasing the likelihood of, of all that happening. Um, before I forget, because we still have a few more minutes, but we're getting close to the end, I'm not going to have a live stream next week. I had a family event pop up and I have to do some traveling. And so I will be traveling next Monday. So I won't be here for the live stream. And I'll post this on the, the channel page. Uh, and for those of you that are live, you know it now. And hopefully if you're watching on replay, you know it as well. But uh, I'll, I'll try to say that at least one more time before the end. So next week, that would be July 25th. I will not have a Monday live stream. But I'll be back the following week and we'll do it all over again. And uh, I'll, I, I may have some stories to, to share from my trip. I don't know. It's not a gardening trip, but I'll be meeting with a lot of family members and we'll be talking and sharing stories. And I'll also share one of those stories with you at the end of the show today. Urban Chicken Mama says, I have four-year-old kiwi plants. They grow well and look great, but still no fruit. Do I maybe have two females and no male? How can I tell? Thanks. Um, yes, yes, it's very possible. So kiwi is one of those plants that, that you need a male plant and you need a female plant. One male plant could do four or five female plants, but four or five female plants will never give you fruit unless you have at least that one male plant. So it is possible. It depends on the variety of kiwi. So, so I was growing a hardy kiwi and the, the male plants will flower and the female plants will flower. And so you'd, you'd have to look at that specific plant. So go online and do some research on that variety of plant. And you should be able to tell by the flower uh, what type it is, one or the other. There are some kiwis where the leaves are slightly different between the males and the females uh, but it varies by the plant and the flower is really the best way to tell but if you've had it for four years um, three years is usually the point that you can expect to start getting fruit on your kiwis and four years you should definitely start seeing some fruit unless your weather conditions have just been crazy but uh, but yeah, do a little more research and look at the flowers. You might be able to tell. Often, no, I won't say often, occasionally, we will buy plants from reputable nurseries that are supposed to be male only or female only or whatever the combination is you're trying to buy when you're getting multiple plants. And it doesn't work out that way. I bought male only asparagus crowns for my asparagus beds that I put in last year. Or I guess it's been two years ago now. And last year, some of those asparagus plants flowered and fruited. And now I've got lots of little asparagus plants growing in those beds. Well, a male only asparagus is not supposed to flower and set seed. That's what the female plant does. So even when some of these nurseries label their plants as male or female, Sometimes they make mistakes and you don't get what you want. So uh, you may have to get another either male or female kiwi, depending on what you can figure out when you start doing closer analysis of, of the flowers that you actually do have. So, okay, let's see. 
Let's do an, another one. Uh, Kimberly says, I do container gardening for my tomatoes. Awesome. I'm growing squash, zucchini, squash, cucumbers, and cantaloupe. Awesome. So uh, they, like I talked about with this background, you, you can grow a ton of plants in containers. And I've mentioned the, the guy I know that has an entire garden in nothing but five gallon buckets. Same thing. He grows tomatoes and squash and zucchini and cucumbers and cantaloupe and peppers. He grows everything in his, his container. So good for you, Kimberly. That's a nice way to be able to, to garden if you don't actually have the, the beds or the, the space. If you rent, it's great for renters that you can have a big garden and just grow in containers and never have to worry about upsetting the landlord because you dug up the lawn to put in a garden. So, okay, thank you for all of those kind words about the trip. And uh, looks like Tony is headed out. So nice to see you, Tony. Thanks for being here. And I'll catch up with you soon. Maybe we can think about video ideas moving into the autumn. That would be awesome. So Riverdale says, some of my asparagus planted all male crowns 10 years ago. I have asparagus come up all over every spring. Yeah, uh, it's a nice idea. Uh, and I've had pretty good success um, with the, the male female plants that I've gotten over the years. But like I said, occasionally it does happen. Jay, you are fantastic. So support Gardner Scott, subscribe to the channel, do a super sticker, super tip, shop the Gardner Scott store, become a member, shop affiliates, thumbs up. Those are all great ways. So thank you. I appreciate that, supporting the store. Um, and so uh, it was pointed out to me uh, recently, and, and I don't know, I'm actually um, uh, asking the question this next week, of, of YouTube, a YouTube meeting I've set up because my merchandise, my t-shirts and mugs are no longer appearing on the videos. And and when I go to try to set it up, it says I'm all set up to do it, but it's not working. So what I've done instead in the description below my newer videos, I haven't changed the descriptions of my older videos, but of my newer videos and of this live stream in particular, I have a link to the t-shirts and the mugs and all the merchandise that's different than that old link that YouTube used to have. And so if you're looking for merch, yeah, click on, on that link in the description below and that'll take you to the, the merchandise store and, and bypass the, whatever the problems are that YouTube has with the Gardner Scott channel right now. And uh, it's, it's an option. I love it when you guys support the channel in all the different ways. And if you haven't subscribed, by all means, subscribe. And if you haven't given a thumbs up, then by all means, give a thumbs up. But if you're not one of those who subscribes or gives a thumbs up or does the merch or joins the membership, that's okay. I'm still doing this. It's all free. I'm still giving you the information. Don't feel any obligation. It is just a nice way to help support um, what I'm doing and help enable me to move forward with some of the other projects that that you're seeing as, as I do these new things, I make videos about it. So uh, that's what it's all for. Hi, Greg. Thank you for that super chat. I appreciate it. Have a great week, everyone. You have a great week. I just hope we can handle the heat that's coming today. Isn't going to set a record, but it's like within one degree of record setting temperatures in our area. Yeah, there's the, the link that Jay posted. So thank you, Greg, for that contribution. And Thanks, Jay, for posting that as well. And so one of the things I'd, I'd, I wanted to end with today as, we, as I, I'm getting ready to take this trip um, that I'll miss next week's show is to not underestimate the impact that your garden has on other people. We often are so critical of our own work, our own gardens. We see all the mistakes. We don't invite people to our garden because we're, we're embarrassed by what we do. I see that too often. You shouldn't be. Every garden is unique. Every garden is different. And every garden has problems. But when people visit your garden, you will probably be surprised to learn that your garden has an impact on their life. It may not arise for years to come, but your garden can have an impact on other people. And the reason I say this is when I'm making this trip, I'm, I'm traveling out to California and I'll be seeing my, my aunt. And I used to spend summers with my aunt and my cousins in California 
many, many years ago, 50 years ago. And I can remember one day in particular, she had a garden and I wasn't interested in gardening at all. And I helped because she asked me harvest some of the garden produce for dinner that night. And I'd done that a few times, didn't really think much about it. But that day in particular, at my aunt's house in her garden, the plants were, were big and green and the bugs were flying all over. And I was picking a tomato for dinner and she said, eat it. It's like, what? I'd never done that. I was a city kid. Neither of my parents gardened. I didn't have gardens as a kid growing up. And so she convinced me to just take a bite out of that tomato that I just harvested off the plant. It was incredible. Now, in the moment, the, as I recall it, my eyes opened up and I was like, wow, that's really good. It was warm from the sun. It was sweet. It was tasty. And it was one of those moments that I have remembered ever since. From 50 years ago, I remember that moment. Now, did I start gardening the next day? No. Did I garden 10 years later? No. But when I started gardening about 20 years later, it was that moment that arose in my memory and made for me the recognition of what a garden could be. And so I've said this before in, in some of my videos, that was my first gardening memory, was in my aunt's garden eating a tomato because she told me to. And here I am today, all these years later, talking to you about gardening. She didn't do it because she saw into the future and knew that I would be on YouTube making gardening videos. She did it because she was just sharing the experience with me. She just knew that eating a tomato fresh from the plant was incredible and she wanted me to experience that. And it, it ultimately changed my life. It, it, took years for me to recognize that that was a formative point in my gardening journey, but I look at that as a very important point in my gardening journey. And so for you, as you share your garden, and I encourage that you share your garden, do it with the knowledge of the future, potentially, making a big difference in that person's life. When you share that raspberry, that snap pea, that strawberry, the leaf, all those plants that can be eaten fresh from the garden, and this is what I do with my grandkids all the time, it creates a memory that may not change them in the short term, but pretty much guarantee you some of those memories are going to stay with them for their entire lives, and you may be germinating a future gardener by the activities that you are doing in your garden when you share your garden with someone else. So never underestimate the impact that you and your garden can have on someone else. Could be a long time from now, but there's an impact to be had. And I encourage that you take that opportunity and, and enjoy it. Relish the moment. If you enjoy something in the garden, share that moment with someone else and they may find that they'll enjoy it and share it with someone else generations to come. So you're important. You can make a big difference in your garden, even though you didn't think you could. I won't be here next Monday, as I just said, but I'll be back in two weeks. And I look forward to seeing you all here as we do this all over again. I hope the weather cooperates in your garden this week, and I hope you have a wonderful gardening week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.